Welcome, everybody. Uh, so pleased you could all make it, and so pleased to be able to have Gus Beth here. My name's John Freitag. I am the moderator of the Universal S Society of Stratford, the current moderator. We've been going since 1798. Gus Beth. Gus, last, last week when Jim Rooney was here, I talked about how um, the rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel once said, when I was young, I admired clever people. Now that I'm old, I admire kind people. Jim Rooney um, was bo is both kind and clever, and so is Gus Speth. You, you probably all know much, much about him, um, his, his wonderful career. We in Stratford are so blessed to have him and Cameron as our neighbors and friends. And I think without any, anything further, I'll just have Gus come up and talk. I don't think I'm nearly as pretty as Jim Rumi. <laughs> oh. I was, John, now you said I should sit here. How is that doing uh, volume-wise? In the back, back there, good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank John and the Society for having me here this evening. I appreciate this so much, and, and honestly, even more, I appreciate the fact that all of you came out and could have been watching the Red Sox lose again, but, uh, <laughs> but, but you're here and, and I'm flattered. Um, John said I should uh, reflect on my life now that it's almost over. <laughs> and uh, to talk about uh, where we've ended up and how we might have gotten here, at, le at least as, as I see it. Um, and uh, I, I thought, you know, I realized I've turned down a number of speaking opportunities over the years, but I don't think I've ever turned down an opportunity to talk about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. And uh, so I want to talk briefly about uh, three periods uh, uh, going back to 1942. Uh, and, um, and, and to uh, try to think of something useful and important to say about each of those uh, periods. Uh, the first one I, I call Growing Up with Cece. Uh, we, we were born in the same little town in the same year, and um, I'll talk about that a little bit, and getting educated and dealing with race uh, a little bit about that, too. Uh, the second period, uh, you know, would have been sort of like 1970 to 2000. Uh, this, for me, was a period of uh, being active, uh, engaged, uh, trying to force issues and get involved. I was with environmental NGOs for a lot of that period in the UN and in, in the federal government. And it's a period of optimism and hope from those 30 years, the second 30 years. And then these last uh, 20 years, <laughs> from 2000 until uh, today, I, I think of as uh, a period of, uh, for me, uh, of stepping back and uh, reflecting on what I'd been through in the previous 60 years. And, uh, and, and I, I tend to think of it as the period of the great discouragement, because I think we're all in some, at some way and in some, some level pretty discouraged by what we're seeing happening today. And of course, it didn't just uh, start today. So the happiest period, uh, getting born, uh, starting out with Cameron in kindergarten. And, that's, uh, and we got to know each other pretty well in kindergarten. And, uh, and then in, in high school, uh, we started going steady. and. Uh, and it was all going along pretty well until we 
realized that we were pitted against each other in the election for the student body president. <laughs> uh, the school always had a boy and a girl run. And, um, and the loser got to be the vice president, kind of like being a vice president now um, for our country. But anyhow, so we were matched off against each other. We gave competing speeches. And, um, and I shudder to think what would have happened if I hadn't won. <laughs> uh, I would have been the first male vice president of, of Orangeburg High School. Uh, I guess I should mention uh, this Orangeburg, a little teeny county seat in the middle of South Carolina, undistinguished but exceedingly pleasant uh, for the white people. And uh, we were about half white and half black, and it was an idyllic place in a lot of ways to grow up. Um, it, it was, uh, uh, we, were, we had a great time. We had a pretty good high school. Uh, we, we learned a lot, and uh, I was very happy to be president of the student body. Um, the race issue, obviously, was a, a sin and a curse and a, a big mark against, uh, against our town and towns like it uh, all over the South. We were deep into Jim Crow, deep into segregation. Everything, you've seen the photographs and read about it, those of you who haven't experienced it, uh, from water fountains to bathrooms, everything was separate and it sure as hell wasn't equal. Um, did I and maybe Cameron uh, know how awful it was? Not really looking back. We were born into this system, we were raised in it, uh, we just kind of accepted it, I'm sad to say, at that point, and, uh, and didn't have cause to think too much about it, despite the fact that the civil rights uh, had, you know, really movement in the way it, it was pushed forward by the Brown decision in 1954, and that was when we had basically started uh, high school and uh, so we should have been more tuned in. We should have been more questioning, but uh, it didn't happen to me uh, then. Um, I think that a lot of us, certainly Cameron and, and I, made a decision in a way that whatever the system around us was, uh, that we were going to be decent and uh, caring. Uh, and respectful of black people in our lives. And, but it was all within this awful framework of, uh, of uh, you know, that wasn't, that didn't, it was so many things you couldn't do, couldn't say, and, and, and the, the was a, this vast deprivation of opportunity, vast deprivation of rights. Uh, and, and that other half of the town lived almost exclusively in abject poverty. So anyhow, I think back we were lucky to get out of there. And I got out of there when my mother said, I want you to go to the best college in the country. And I, I said, uh, well, help me out here, Mom. <laughs> where, where, where could that be? And, uh, and I wanted to be a scientist, and, and, she, and I said, well, can I go to MIT? And she said, yes, if you can get in, but you ought to apply some other places. So it turns out that um, Yale gave me a big scholarship and made it possible for me to go there, and MIT didn't. They let me in, but they didn't pay for it. And uh, so I went off to Yale and was gonna be a scientist and studied chemistry, biochemistry for the first couple of years. Um, but, um, you know, a funny thing happened to me at Yale. I was confronted vigorously by my classmates and, and other students uh, really hammering at me 
wanting to know what I thought about this and that, where I stood on these things. And meanwhile, I was getting really a, a, a first-rate education for the first time, and I was coming to see things differently from a different perspective. And the world up there was so very different from the world that I had grown up in. And I was constantly being, you know, yo-yoed or ratcheted between going home several times a year and coming back to Yale. And, uh, and I really uh, eventually had something of an epiphany uh, in which this scaffolding of uh, 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 this, uh, this uh, sort of environment, the scaffolding in which one is raised and in which one just kind of accepts uh, as one might accept the parents' political parties or whatever else some of you might have accepted at one point. And that scaffolding came, boom, crashing down. And when I was at Yale, thanks to my fellow students and to others and the world, which was changing all around me, and I was being educated, uh, and I'm, it was a, an extraordinary thing for me to be sort of opened up to anything. I mean, I had, at that point, so much of what I had been thought was right and raised to believe, I thought was nonsense. It was, it was racist garbage. And, uh, and the society that I thought was so wonderful was so terribly flawed. And it all seemed crashing down. So it was, in a way, it was liberating because if, if you ever have had that experience when the system abandons, or you abandon the system you were raised in, then it, it, you're liberated to create something on your own, to put together a life, uh, a set of values and orientations on your own. And, and that happened to me, and it's one of the great things that, that happened to me. Uh, it didn't happen to all the people in my family, uh, you may remember the Mississippi summer when a lot of people descended on Mississippi. I think it was maybe the summer of, um, of 63, uh, about. And, uh, and, and so I, my buddies at Yale, I said, well, when you're on the way down to Mississippi, stop and stay with us. Uh, you know, we're part way to Mississippi. And they did. And we were having a good old time around the dinner table joking with my parents. And somehow it got a little off track. <laughs> and the next thing I knew, they, my father was shouting at them and they were shouting back at my father and I was climbing under the table. <laughs> um, but that was, that's the way it was. I mean, people, thank goodness, were speaking up and there were some of us who were listening and changing as a result. I got out of Yale and went to Oxford and um, you'll appreciate this. My job over, my thing over in, at Oxford at the university was to study economics, which I, I, I did for a couple of years. But what you may not know is that while I was studying economics, Cameron was teaching economics. <laughs> You'll have to ask her about that story, but that's, that's the way it was. Meanwhile, this peaceful little town, uh, Orangeburg, South Carolina, um, in the end couldn't contain this issue in its uh, peaceful way and exploded in 1968. Uh, as I was moving to the end of my law school years into what is known by some as the Orangeburg Massacre. And uh, it was um, uh, a civil rights demonstration by the students at South Carolina State College, now State University, uh, which was in Orangeburg. And, um, and there was some accusation that a shot was fired to the state troopers who were trying to put down the demonstration, which they shouldn't have been in there. They shouldn't have been with all those, uh, all those high-powered rifles and buckshot, and they shot into the crowds of what turns out to have been a totally peaceful demonstration on the campus. The, South, the state police just shot them. 
many of them in the bottoms of their feet because they had hit the ground and that was all that was exposed. Several were killed, uh, 20 roughly were seriously wounded and, uh, and that in a way was the end of this little town of Orangeburg among other things. They still have a memory, a memorial for this event uh, at South Carolina uh, State, State College. Um, anyhow, um, in law school, late 60s, child of the 60s, been through Vietnam, the civil rights concerns. Uh, I was, you know, fully in the front lines of, of of wanting to go out and change the world like so many other people in the 60s. And uh, I knew that I did not want to go to work for a law firm. That was the last thing on earth I wanted to do. I, my father said, well, why are you at law school? And, uh, and I really didn't have a very good answer, but I said, we'll do something good for the world. And I had this uh, thought uh, on, um, on the train going into New York, um, uh, one day uh, that, you know, I had read this article about the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, and I thought to myself, you know, I'm really interested in environment, and some of my other people are too. Why don't we create an NAACP Legal Defense Fund for the environment? And I went back and I pushed this idea with some of my buddies at the school, and we all agreed we should do it. And so what did, what did, well, we need a proposal, a grant proposal. So we sat down in our uh, third year at law school and drafted a grant proposal. And they said, now what do we do with the grant proposal? Well, what else? Let's take it to the Ford Foundation. And uh, so off we went uh, to New York with our proposal to the Ford Foundation. And it's a long story. It took another year of various ins and outs, but we got this fabulously big grant from the Ford Foundation to create what became the Natural Resources Defense Council. And we cranked that up in 1970. And it was the period in which the Clean Air Act had just been written. Two years later, we would get the Clean Water Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Toxic Substances Control Act. This was when this period in the early 70s was this halcyon days for environmental action when all the great laws uh, were written, and, uh, and our job as bright young lawyers was to go to court and enforce them, and we did. We just had more fun, and, and, and we really caught the agencies and others off guard. They didn't know what was coming at them because they really weren't on top of what the laws required, and, and they did a poor job, and they were easy to block things like big water projects and to force action on toxic substances and other things that we did. Um, and um, I had a bunch of lawsuits, and, and I'm not bragging because I think this is generally true that year. I never lost a lawsuit. Uh, and it was mostly forcing governments to do things or not do things. Um, not that much litigation against the private sector, but anyhow, uh, it was, uh, these, were the, these were the great days of, uh, uh, of environmental action uh, in which so many of the patterns uh, that, um, that we uh, are familiar with today were, were set. We went to court, we, we figured it, uh, our little NRDC, well, we, we probably ought to, we, we, the first few lawsuits we had these things called clients. And, uh, and they were pesky, you know, they had things that they wanted. And so we said, no, let's, cr let's be our own plaintiff. So we have to do that, we had to go out and get members. And that got us into direct mail. You probably, all of you are remembering some aspects of this kind of world. I think. So out go thousands and thousands of letters asking people to join the Natural Resources Defense Council. And that happened for lots of environmental and other related groups. And so we created our own uh, we started suing in our own names at that point. And uh, anyhow, uh, we'll never recreate that, that moment of, uh, of environmental action and progress. Um, and, um, but it, um, we just couldn't lose. And it was, uh, I worked on water issues, wetlands issues, nuclear power questions, 
Um, partly as a result of what I was doing, I got uh, kind of spotted by Cardo, maybe just some of Cardo's people, and, and they and. Uh, when he won in 76, they asked me to come into the government to be a member and then the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, which has had a checkered history, I would say. Um, but in these days, it was a rather powerful White House group uh, mo modeled on the Council of Economic Advisors. And, uh, and I'm really proud of what Carter did environmentally over those four years and our job at this council at CEQ was to provide him with uh, uh, the support that he needed to do those things and to be his in-house environmental advisors. So uh, we had a ball doing that. Part of the way there in about 1979, I got a visit from the scientist and a head of Friends of the Earth and they said, you've got to do something about the key issue where the administration is not that active. And I said, what is it? They said, the climate issue. This is much bigger than anybody imagines. And I said, well, if you'll get me a report that I can take to the president and others on the seriousness of the climate issue, I'll do it and I'll make a big deal about it. And they did, and I did. And it really was the first time that the climate issue got into the controversy within an administration and moved to the point of being uh, a focus of uh, political consideration. Carter, didn't, Carter would have done something in a second term, but in 1980 when we were, we put out about six reports on the climate issue from the Council on Environmental Quality in that year, in that, that time. We knew back then plenty to tackle the issue. We knew what had to be done. There was no mystery about the need to go to renewables and high energy efficiencies and uh, new types of vehicles. Uh, we had, we, there were reports that were pouring out of our agency and others about how to do all this. You know, and just remember this was over 40 years ago. We knew enough to set a goal uh, for the buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. We wrote a, a report that came out in 1980 in the administration uh, for how to do that, uh, what that goal ought to be. It was a little relaxed by current understandings, but we weren't badly off, and it would have made a hell of a difference. And Carter started these huge programs for solar and energy efficiency, and then Reagan comes in and squelches the whole thing, symbolized by the, his taking those solar collectors off the White House roof that Carter had put there. And um, another thing we did in the Carter years uh, was to um, produce a report called the Global 2000 Report, which was an effort to look at global scale environmental and population resource concerns and not just dom domestic issues. Uh, climate being, you know, key in that list of say 10 big global scale problems. So the Global 2000 report looked ahead at what the world might look like if we don't address those issues. It was a scary report. And Carter, in the middle of his campaign, bravely stepped forward and released our report, even though some advised him not to do it. It was a hell of a good report. And it, yeah, and it was so good it turned out to actually come to pass, more or less, uh, by the year 2000. Uh, the predictions uh, of uh, species loss and climate and other things held up pretty well over the ensuing 20 years. And, and so it's a reflection of the fact that not much was done uh, about these issues despite our, our efforts. Um, at the end of that, when, when the voters unceremoniously dismissed us from our positions in the White House, um, I wanted to work on these global scale issues, so I started another group called the World Resources Institute. And this time I, I went chugging off to Chicago to find the MacArthur Foundation and asked them for money. And they gave us a big grant, and so we had this, uh, this WRI got started. And it's going great. All my groups have done better after I left. <laughs> and, um, 
And, and, and it became the group that, and I was there for, for 10 years as, as president, and um, it became the group that, that I think deserves a tremendous amount of credit for putting these global scale concerns of deforestation, biodiversity loss, loss of fisheries, fresh water, uh, loss of soils and desertification and climate, putting all this, this, these issues on the map as big concerns. And it's still doing it. Uh, so there, the WRI, uh, I think, was a good thing and still is. Um, and then, thanks to Al Gore, the vice president at the time, he put me forward to run the UN's biggest agency, uh, the UN Development Program. And uh, so um, it, uh, we, we moved to New York, and, and uh, I was there for six years running uh, UNDP. In the process, I went to about 115 countries. I went to a whole bunch of them many times, some of them to raise money for the program. Uh, and, but I was left with this overwhelming sense of how really deprived most people in the world really are, and how little they have, and uh, how desperate the conditions are around the world, and and often how you know um, positive people were and happy people were, or seemingly happy despite all of that, and how terrible the U.S. performance internationally was in general and how we were contributing to so many of the problems and, and helping on a scale of, say, Denmark uh, in dealing with the problems. Uh, and um, so, so by the end of this uh, second 30 years, uh, you know, I, I felt good about things. I felt good about... Um, you know, the organizations that I had helped to participate in building and chairing the CEQ and, and running this uh, UN agency. And, um, but I made a big mistake uh, at that point. I decided to start reflecting on things and, um, and thinking about what's going on really in the world and and whether we were making the kind of progress that we anticipated we would be making, say, at the first Earth Day in 1970. And so I started studying a lot. And the good news is that I had taken the position of dean at the environment school back at Yale. And uh, being dean is not a terribly hard job. So I had some time to teach and to study uh, what had been going on and what the prospects were for the future uh, at that point. And this gets into my sort of third period here. Um, the, uh, so I began to think and study and teach about these issues, which certainly makes one focus on them. And, um, and I think it, um, and I, one particular question is, uh, did we accomplish what we set out to do in the, at Earth Day in 1970, at the famous Stockholm Conference in 1972? Um, and after really a tremendous amount of research and thinking over a period of years, um, I, uh, I concluded that things were not going well. Um, and it wasn't some epiphany, it wasn't some bias towards against uh, the government or America or uh, it was just what the facts were telling me. Uh, and it led to three books uh, that I guess the ones I'm, I'm proudest of in a way. Uh, Yale Press published this American Crisis series. And the first one was a book called Red Sky at Morning in 2004 about the, the failures of our international approaches to environmental governance. And then I, I wrote a book uh, called The Bridge at the Edge of the World, which was a look more, more domestically uh, at, uh, at US 
performance and lack thereof on environmental and related issues. And then a book called America the Possible in, in 2012, which looked at not just at environmental issues, but a whole host of social and, and uh, political and democratization concerns. And I actually did that book uh, when I was at the Vermont Law School um, and uh, teaching there. And Dean Shields, who many of you will remember, invited me to give a lecture series. Uh, and, and some of you may have even been there when I inflicted these lectures on people. Uh, and, uh, but that became uh, America the Possible. And what all three of these books and everything that I had worked on during this whole period, uh, you know, they were screaming two key messages. Um, one is that the, the way we were going about these issues and, and the, 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 the superficiality of how we were attacking uh, these issues wasn't working. And secondly, um, that the environmental problems uh, were not uh, superficial or simply the result of some uh, a mistake or lack of attention or not enough money. They really were the manifestations uh, of, uh, uh, of our political economy. Our systems of political economy uh, were the root. That's where the root of the problem is. And um, so, um, and it also a sort of sub point in, in these books was that it's not just environment where things are going downhill. It's a host of other issues involving our political performance, uh, our performance in other social and uh, gender and, and other areas. And, and you know, one of the conclusions that I harped on a lot was that if you look at the rich countries, the OECD countries, we're at the bottom of almost all of them in things that you want to care about, uh, like dem democratic performance and uh, uh, equal opportunity even, and the, uh, and the treatment of children and healthcare and education performance. We're at the bottom, still are. Um, so these are the themes that I kept pursuing uh, over, the, over these years. Uh, I taught courses about them at the Vermont Law School, and uh, and I, you know, wrote and written a tons of articles, and we formed some new groups focused on on these issues, uh, the Next System Project, and the New Economy Network. And here's kind of what I want to say about this: that in the end, uh, the perspective that I've, I've come to is quite radical, um, too radical for a lot of people, because it says that the problem behind the problems is our political economy, uh, our linked economic and political systems. It's a radical perspective because it says that the problem is capitalism as we know it, the corporate supremacy, the profit motive, the growth imperative, our runaway consumerism, and our wrong-headed values. And it's that syndrome, that complex of issues uh, that are the defining features of our political economy that's giving rise to not just environment and climate problems, but uh, a host of others. So I decided that one thing I could do, or should do, since I'd, my roots were in the environmental community, is that I should try to go out to them and, uh, and preach to them this, this gospel of, uh, of digging deeper for real root causes, and, uh, and not just going after the surface manifestations of pollution and, and other things. You know, why are we? so? Here's the kind of thing that I would say to, and have said to them a lot. Uh, ad nauseum, maybe. Um, we must ask again the basic question, what's an environmental issue? 
Well, air pollution, water pollution, sure. But what if the right answer is that environmental, environmental issues include anything, at least the big things, that actually determine environmental outcomes? Then, surely, if that is the case, a creeping plutocracy and corporatocracy that we face every day, the ascendancy of money power and corporate power over people power, those are environmental issues. And more, the chartering and empowering of artificial persons to do virtually anything in the name of profit and growth, that's, it, that's the very nature of today's corporation. The fetish of GDP growth, as the ultimate public good and the main aim of government, our runaway consumerism, our vast social insecurity with half of the families living paycheck to paycheck. These are among the underlying drivers of environmental outcomes. These are the things that are preventing and slowing and stymieing environmental success. There are environmental concerns, imperative environmental concerns, but they rarely appear on the agenda of any environmental group. Some creeping in around the edges, but even the most likely target, our consumerism, most environmental groups uh, don't, our lifestyles, our choices about these things are not really front and center in their work. So I said, here's the new agenda for environmentalism, that you should embrace a profound challenge to consumerism and commercialism and the lifestyles that they offer. You should embrace a turning away from growth mania and the profit-centered economy, a redefinition of what society should be striving to grow. We should challenge the corporate dominance and seek a transformation in the nature of the corporation and its goals. A commitment to deep change in both the reach of the market and the ownership of productive assets. And we should launch a powerful assault on the materialistic, anthropocentric, and contemporocentric values that currently dominate American culture. So system change is, I was preaching it and have for now, many years, is essential because environmental problems and many other of our problems are rooted in the defining features of our current political economy. Well, that's an awful lot to expect anybody to absorb. Uh, and, uh, and, and to be honest, I really didn't get very far with my uh, preaching to uh, uh, my environmental audience is they haven't really changed very much. Uh, and, um, and I still, uh, this is a conviction. If we really want to deal with the climate issue, uh, if we want to deal with our other great social problems, we're going to have to start a process of uh, changing the political economy, changing the nature and the good news is that there's a lot of concern out there now for transformative change in the United States, which is just another way of, of putting what I've been talking about. It, I noticed just the other day that when the Reverend Benjamin Barber had his great march on Washington, the, uh, the theme of that uh, was transformation is what we need. And it is. Um, so that's kind of my, my story. Um, and um, so let me give you some, some final thoughts uh, that grow out of all of this, uh, six of them, um, very quickly. Uh, your impression that America is in deep trouble is not wrong, it's right. Uh, climate, democracy, the situation today is uh, tragic beyond recall, and it's going to get worse uh, before we can 
make it better. Um, there's a big risk that in, in action on the climate front uh, will eventually, if not, if perpetuated, and, and if there's not something better done uh, to reduce emissions sharply, that the climate situation is going to become so severe that it will consume our efforts and our energies and will not really allow us to go for the more positive futures uh, that we, we hope for. The climate issue, it can foreclose uh, positive possibilities. Uh, thirdly, uh, we need hope, a lot of it. Um, keep hope alive. We've got to. Uh, but no more hopium. Um, hopium is a drug that people take to avoid uh, having to really face realities and do something about it. Um, hopium is the easy chair. The hope is a kick in the butt to get out there and do something. Even more than hope, we, we need to resist uh, and to fight. Uh, even to resist beyond hope, uh, to resist where the situation has moved to hopeless because we should never accept the unacceptable. And, you know, much as Camus said that the real, the real thing that made Sisyphus a hero was that he kept going to push that rock up to the top, knowing full well that it would fall back down. And you know, even in situations where it has become hopeless, it's important to keep fighting. You don't have to believe to put it all on the line, to fight every way you can that you're going to win. Um, the fifth thing is that um, we, we need to be crisis ready. Uh, there's going to come a point in which the escalating climate risks and the fear of what climate is bringing us is going to force uh, or could force, if, if properly pursued, governments to respond meaningfully, finally, to the crisis. Uh, we're not quite there yet, obviously, but we're seeing the buildup of this momentum now. And we have to be ready when that, that moment comes. We can't get it wrong, and we can't delay when it does come. If we do delay, there's a real risk that we will move into uh, the realm of climate chaos. Um, when trying to cope with the effects of climate change consumes all of our energies. And so we have to get ready for that moment. There needs to be a massive civil mobilization, a lot of cons more consensus than there is now on what we need to do to address the climate issue and a coalescing of all the progressive forces in the country before it's too late and we move into that realm of climate uh, chaos. And in the meanwhile, we've got to begin thinking about and pursuing this deep question of system change. What are the things that can be done now that plant the seeds for deep system change later? Um, and uh, with the goal, uh, we need to define the kind of political economy that we really want. And, and I would submit uh, it's one in which good results for people and place and planet are automatic, are routine, are not the result of an endless uh, struggle 
uh, to get modest gains, but flow naturally out of the system of political economy of people in place and planet. And, and so, I mean, I've edited a book now on what a bunch of new systems like that would look like. Is it, we, we need to start the process of identifying the new political economy that we want, uh, what we want it to do for us and for our children and for nature. And, um, and we need to start laying the, the, the moving in these directions. Uh, and there, you know, I've, in my writings, I've identified about a dozen different directions that uh, we need to, that should be pursued. Um, and uh, we can talk about that if you like. But um, one key thing about these, these directions uh, is, is to find what are sometimes called non-reformist reforms. And these are things that look like reformist actions of a more traditional type, but have in them the seeds of deep change. Uh, and, um, and I just will mention one that, that, that I think is so central. Uh, I mean, a tremendous influence that we give to the system of national accounts now, and of course, GDP, uh, and the centrality of GDP as a uh, uh, as our uh, you know goal for governance, and it is a perfectly worthless measure of anything except the churning of economic activity, uh, the churning in the economy, and if we could, and a lot of work has been done on this, including by great economists like Joe Stiglitz. If we could create a, uh, an alternative uh, set of measures of national well-being and, and national progress that can dispatch uh, GDP uh, into the background, uh, that would be the kind of thing that a lot of traditional liberals who don't have a lot of radical ideas in their heads but know that this is the kind of thing that, that makes good sense. And if we could move towards sort of a new system of, of measurements of well-being, of progress, uh, you know, I think that would make a huge difference. And, and it would be, uh, it looks, uh, you know, very acceptable. Uh, and it, and it, could, uh, it could be, in the end, uh, deeply transformative. And I'll just mention one reason why. What happens when you, when you do that and you come up with some of these new measures is that, uh, and there's been one done for Vermont uh, by the Gunn Institute at UVM, uh, what it shows is that, you know, despite the increases in GDP or state incomes, uh, real well-being has leveled off and sometimes begin even to go down. A and so we're getting totally misleading signals uh, from the GDP measurement. And uh, so we would know if we had these alternative measures, that things uh, were really as bad as they seem to be sometimes. Um, so that's, um, that's my happy message. Uh, the, uh, we're in a hell of a pickle, and, um, and uh, there's a lot we can do, and we ought to, uh, in, in several different directions, and we need to um, get busy doing it. Thank you. for questions and comments and attacks uh, or <laughs> supports or whatever. Uh, yeah, Ross. I just wondered how involved our young people are um, with all that you've been talking about. Uh, I think it's terribly important. And I'm talking about 18 to the 30 year olds, particularly their age group. They have the energy, they have the, not that all of the knowledge, but a lot of it. And how, how involved are we getting and how do we get them 
truly important. Well, you're absolutely right about the importance of this group, but you've also put your finger on a, an area of, of real hope and, and, uh, and encouragement because um, they are involved and in many ways have been driving the climate issue. I mean, I think one of the best groups in, in, in working in Washington today is, uh, is Sunrise. And, and Sunrise has been pushing, uh, you know, sitting in in Nancy Pelosi's office saying, you know, where are you gonna, what are you gonna, how are you gonna get the climate issue moving in? And, and they're very effective, uh, they're very thoughtful, they're very smart, and they're very young. Uh, and uh, of course, we know about Greta and her movement, uh, and uh, and then you know, and this in a way, in a way, the youth movement, kind of one of its early starts, uh, was this uh, suit that uh, 21 young people have brought against the federal government for inaction, uh, the so-called Juliana case, and uh, still trying to get it into court. Meanwhile, the same group has has represented young people in a variety of lawsuits at the state level, and they're making more, more progress. And abroad, the courts are getting very uh, active on this issue and pushing governments to, to do things, and, and as well as big corporations. So this, internationally, the judiciary is ahead of where we are in the US, but it's coming. But the bottom line is, young people are really central to this, and they are indeed the force that's been driving it. You know, if you add to that, uh, some the frontline communities that have been most impacted by climate uh, disturbances, uh, the indigenous peoples movements that have been fighting pipelines and other things. I mean, this is really the core of the opposition to big fossil right now. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Gus, I didn't say thank you for your speech. I don't. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, the big problem is the obscenely wealthy that became that way because of the political system that we've had. Um, there's a lot of power in money, so how do we go about how do we go about making change when you're dealing against so many people that are so obscenely wealthy and so obscenely powerful? Well, I mean that is the problem. Uh, I mean they they really are. Um, you know, tremendously powerful, and the fossil industry is tremendously powerful, and they they have uh, their supporters. And if you, you know, if we if it weren't Mansion in there throwing the spanner into the actions, it, they'd find somebody else to do it or some other way to to block progress. Um, I think um, you know the um, just the, there are two two sort of uh, fronts in this in this area. Uh, you know, one is how do we get enough momentum uh, to force the federal government uh, and others to, to act? Um, and, and, you know, there are many dimensions of that, but we, we can see uh, that, um, that, that we, you know, we have the makings of a coalescing of groups to force action. It hasn't happened, and one of my big frustrations is that you know we we haven't really come together as a progressive community to demand at a sort of highest decibel level uh, what needs to that the federal government and other state governments need to act. So we need to to work on on coalescing and building a, a grand movement uh, for action, and uh, and we need to get out of our comfort zone in terms of advocacy. Uh, I mean we all myself included have been guilty of what I would call comfortable advocacy. Uh, you know, doing the, the easy things, uh, the fun things, uh, but I think we've got to get uh, really uh, out there uh, and, and be not only more insistent and consistent, but also raising issues uh, like the sit-in in Nancy Pelosi's office. Uh, we need to be in the streets like they are with the Extinction Rebellion in the UK blocking bridges and other things. I mean, everything has got to kind of explode from the point of view of citizen activity and action. Uh, and, and we need to build towards that. Um, 
and, and you know, because I mean, right now, just the other day, a bunch of Hill staffers sat in on on Senator Schumer's office uh, and um, got arrested. Hill staffers, uh, uh, and uh, so this is the kind of thing that I think we need a, a ton more of. Uh, we need a lot more attention from different communities on this issue. We see some breakthroughs with the media now. Um, and uh, they're tending to the issue after decades of ignoring the climate connection to, to serious uh, weather and uh, events. Uh, but they now have, are beginning to talk about it. Uh, and, um, and, and, and that's good, but we need a lot more of it. And we have to be very wary because the media will turn its attention onto something that's more novel and different uh, on a dime. Um, and church groups, religious organizations uh, have started to raise these issues, but we need to do, uh, there needs to be a lot more of that. Scientists are start st starting to speak out in a way that they hadn't for decades, uh, believing that it wasn't the scientific way. Uh, they've started to speak out and we need a lot more of that. Um, the, um, so I think there's a, uh, a pressure that has to build. Meanwhile, the climate situation is going to get worse. And uh, it's baked in now. Uh, and we're not doing anything to make it not worse anyhow. So it's going to get worse. And as it does, the, 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 num the victimization uh, and the alarm and the fear is going to grow. And as I was saying earlier, you know, we have to be ready for that moment when, when this combination of a rising population and, uh, and, uh, and the great fear of what the climate issue is doing to us comes together. And, uh, and it's a moment of democratic possibility. And, and at that moment, we have to be ready with, the, with, the, you know, with a lot of agreement on how to solve this problem. We have to be wary that we don't get co-opted or sidetracked by the big corporations into some uh, half, half measure or measure that really isn't core to doing this problem. And I think part of the answer at that point is really should be a law uh, that says that, uh, that, that mandates the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, all the gases from all the sectors with a target and timetable for their reduction. And, uh, and, and enforced not only by governments uh, and regulatory agencies, but by citizen suits and the courts. We know how to do this. We, had a we have a model for that kind of an approach, and it was the Clean Air Act and the Clean Water Act. Uh, and um, so we need that kind of tough-minded regulatory statute. Some people say, well, we shouldn't do that. We should have a huge tax uh, on, on greenhouse gas emissions and use the money for something good, including perhaps giving it back to people. And uh, that's all right. I think there are a lot of good approaches. We just need to be together on what we need to do and when we need to do it and be ready to do it when the crisis makes it possible. That's sort of one big issue. I mean, the other big issue is how do you wrestle to earth this, the change needed uh, uh, that would lead to uh, a transformation of our political economy? Uh, and. And, and there, um, you know, what I've tried to do is to, the, the idea of system change is, is a mouthful, and it's big, it's too big. So what I've tried to do is break it down into about a dozen categories uh, of where action could make a huge difference. And then to analyze, well, what's going on in that area? Uh, what's, and, and what needs to be done in that area? Uh, and it's not cosmic anymore. Just to give you this one example, um, one of the, if you think about the corporate power, which was raised a moment ago, you know, you, one, there, there are different, there's a kind of pincer movement that's possible. Uh, one is to, to begin to rein in the giant corporations in new ways. They all exist, there's been historically a lot of interest in federal corporate charters in the United States. And uh, so why not put all the companies under a federal charter and not just a Delaware charter that 
does nothing. Uh, put them under a federal charter, put some rules and guidelines in there, require that they serve the public interest, have a sunset clause on their charters, uh, have public hearings periodically where the question of the, is the company sticking to its charter provisions uh, or is it violating them? So there's a lot, and that's just one area for, and there's a lot of research that's been done on corporate chartering. Um, and uh, the other part of the Pincer movement is to build up a new corporate, a new business economy uh, apart from the big giants. And, and that's going on at a, at a good pace in the country. Uh, you, you have uh, a lot of uh, different types of, of co-ops. Uh, you have uh, public-private hybrids, uh, a, a rebirth of public enterprise uh, in a lot of places, um, and, um, and uh, profit-not-for-profit hybrids. Uh, Vermont is a leader in these areas of, of new enterprise types, and, um, and, and we need to build on that and support it. And, 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 and Bernie, God bless him, has had uh, legislation proposed in the Congress that would uh, uh, enhance a direction, th th these directions towards building up this new system, uh, including opportunities for employees uh, to take over and run and own the companies. Uh, you know, more worker-owned enterprises and things of this type. So there's a, you know, there are things that, if, and I have this identified in sort of dozen different, different areas, um, you know, uh, and I won't, I, I could talk about them all, <laughs> a lot, but I'll start with the corporations. But they, are, they you know, they're different. Uh, they're, there's a lot to be done, uh, and there's a lot going on in the country. Uh, there are a lot of models of how to pursue these dozen transitions. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, they start slowly, but they also uh, reinforce each other. And at some point, they, you know, could really begin to, to take off. Sure. Yeah. How important are electoral politics? It, seem, it seems to me that two key elections were in 1980 and in 2000. You know, if Jimmy Carter, for instance, had gotten a second term, things would be much different. If Al Gore had actually won, um, it, it been certified as president, um, things would be a lot, a lot different. Don't we need to focus some on electoral politics to yeah. give the space for the, for the vision yeah. About no, you're a absolutely right. I, I obviously have this article that I'm trying to get published now uh, in which I lay out sort of five things that need to happen if we're going to get to the point where we can make a decent choice as to how to go about dealing with the climate issue. And one of those five things is a, uh, uh, is a, a huge new emphasis on, uh, on electoral politics. And I say in there that we really don't need uh, we really, really don't need more uh, scientific uh, studies of this problem. We really don't need more intelligent policy proposals to deal with this issue, honestly. What we really need is more good politicians. And, uh, and, and so, you know, I, I, I think that this, um, the, 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 what has happened historically is that this, uh, these 501c3 laws have uh, inhibited, um, in fact, pro prohibited uh, groups uh, from going into um, uh, electoral politics. And some have broken out of that and created little satellite institutions like the NRDC Action Fund that work on politics and electing candidates. Uh, the Sierra Club has never had quite that problem, uh, but uh, it, it, what we really need to do is to have a huge expansion of engagement in electoral politics by all of these groups, and they need to be organized and, and orchestrated together, uh, as often the, the groups on the, the right are doing. So, so you're you're absolutely right, John. That's a critical part of, of this, and uh, and it really needs to happen as early as this year, and certainly by 
24. Um, the, um, so it's, um, you know, and we know how, how what a, uh, an issue all these, uh, the, the, what a complexity uh, these things are and, and how we need to, to protect our electoral system and, and its integrity. And I don't know if you saw the Steve Bannon special on CNN the other day, but this was, this was frightening. It's, you know, even, it's, it scared even me. Uh, and uh, because, you know, going back, even before Trump was elected, he was out there working to organize uh, uh, election workers. And there's a huge movement out there now to, uh, to take over the election systems. Uh, and um, so anyhow, uh, it's, gonna be a, it's going to be a, a struggle. Uh, but uh, getting good people elected is the sine qua non. Yes? Perhaps it is related. It, it, it seems as though Republicans um, and, and Democrats are both beholden to the military industrial complex. And the, you know, as you undoubtedly know, because the, what is it, the Department of Defense budget for the Pentagon is what, 400? $80 billion, and the Senate wants to increase it another $10 billion now. And on both sides of the aisle, these are passed. I mean, do, are these, is our elected representatives so beholden to money from these groups that something has to shift there? Well, it's a huge problem. Uh, it truly really is. I mean, they, you know, these arms manufacturers, they, they put, uh, components of their industries in, in all the key states and all the key congressional districts they can manage to get into in order to be able to, to sway the situations there. Um, and uh, what we, I think at one time we were, our arms, our military budget was equal to the top of the 14 countries. I think it may be down to about nine or 10 now, but, um, it's uh, no, it's a, it's it's an outrage, and it's nothing we can do except keep uh, uh, hammering these these issues home, um, and uh, and and trying to avoid getting uh, into you know endless wars. Um, I wish I had a uh, you know I had thought about uh, the answer on the on the military. They, they, have, they have done some decent things in terms of being aware of the climate issue and being concerned about it. Uh, and uh, yes, no, it's a huge problem. I, and, I, um, it's, um, and you would think that uh, we would have, you know, more power to deal with it, but an administration would without the Congress to deal with those issues. Uh, and uh, so we'll see. It would be interesting if, if Biden ever gets the courage to establish a, a climate emergency, uh, you know, what doors that would open and, uh, and, and who he might be able to mobilize to, uh, in that effort. Uh, yeah. So <clears throat> this is a comment, not a question. Thank you so much for your very informative talk with us. And I know from talking to people around that sometimes people feel like the problem is so huge, there's nothing I can do about it. And I just wanted to say that there's some flyers out there you can pick up that track the climate actions produced. And one of them is about the things you can do to help get out the vote because the election is coming up. If we don't have good people in Washington, we're sunk. And the way to get good people in Washington is often to get good people at the state level. So there's some links and you can explore more of it and for uh, some actions you can take and other things you can do in your household and stuff. So I just wanted to clear up the right. table outside. Well, good for you and, and good for you for leading this effort for all these years now. And um, I think, um, you know, one of our, I suggested to one of our leading environmental groups in the state the other day that they should, uh, you know, why not have, in addition to the traditional environmental work that's being done on the the new climate legislation and other things, 
You know, why don't you sketch out a, uh, a platform uh, of your work that would aim at, uh, at, at Vermont being a, uh, a seedbed uh, for transformative change of the type that we would like to see in the country as a whole. And, and you know, we have a lot of great stuff going on in Vermont um, uh, along these lines, and, uh, and there's a lot more to be done uh, if, if we could, uh, I mean, you know, we're very close to a state bank in Vermont with different funds of different, for different things. You know, uh, it could be, and we're very close to having an alternative uh, to, to GDP for Vermont uh, in the genuine progress indicator that, that uh, UVM works up. And there's a lot that's going on. And, you know, we have this, this huge number of co-ops in the state. There's a lot that can be done in Vermont to kind of set a national goal a national standard of, uh, of, trend, of deep transition. Uh, so, you know, just to bring it home, I mean, uh, uh, I didn't get a positive response. <laughs> yeah? <clears throat> From all your prolific writing, uh, which book would be a good one to start with and what, what might be one that's most relevant today? <laughs> Um, well, the good news is that they're still available. Um, <laughs> and um, I, I think they, I, I wrote a book called the third, the third one in that American Crisis series is called America the Possible. Uh, it was written in uh, 2012, so just a decade ago. It's only a decade old. Uh, nothing much has changed. It's ever, things have gotten worse. Uh, but um, I think it's 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 kind of my my deepest book, and it looks it it looks at even the military industrial complex and uh, uh, all the, the the key issues, and it, it has a it begins with a a kind of a pretty bleak assessment of where things are, which as I say has gotten worse, but it then goes into uh, uh, policies that we could adopt to deal with consumerism, to deal with corporations. Uh, you know, and um, the, uh, to, to make the market uh, really an effective positive force um, to deal with, with growth. Uh, what do we do uh, if we're, you know, not uh, focusing on, on GDP growth as the be all and end all? Uh, there's a lot of interest in, in new, new systems of uh, or new ways of thinking about money. I mean, here's one thing to think about, for example. Almost all investment decisions in the United States today are made on the basis of a search for high financial returns. Of course, right? Everybody knows that. Uh, but what if they were made on the basis for high social and environmental returns? And you had metrics for measuring that and ways of prom promoting that. And you could really uh, uh, get the, a heavy democratic thumb uh, on the investment process. Well, that would be deep change. Yes. I'm curious to oh. play around with your idea um, of the roots of economic change. And it strikes me if we move away from our kind of uh, American capitalism to something that might be uh, much more productive for everybody, that we need to talk about changing some of our imagery because capitalism is so built on uh, individualism, I pick myself up by my own bootstraps, what you're talking about in terms of um, even um, uh, measuring my, my value by um, my stock or my, you know, the GDP. How much, how much are you worth? <laughs> no, that was, that was just a joke. <laughs>
which then leads to, to one other thought. Um, democratic socialism in other countries has somehow been built on this idea of the commons. People don't get all excited about thinking about uh, common health, common education. Right. But we just don't serve here. And I don't know whether you saw Larry Summers comment today, which really set me off for a fellow who was, you know, so much involved in the treasury and uh, representing elite Ivy League schools and his passes did. He was blaming inflation um, and gas prices on um, the poor. <laughs> and was doing that on the basis of the government giving all of these $1,400 and $1,200 checks to people, which they then went out and spent, which meant that then the supply chain got all fouled up because they were spending money on things. And that if that doesn't prove that government giveaways to the poor um, is the wrong way to go. And, and that struck me in terms of some reading I've been doing about the imagery of Jesus and taking care of the poor. Um, and the Catholic preferential option, God's preferential option for the poor. And somehow we need to get the poor into our image of we, uh, into our um, not me but us kind of thinking so that when we talk about economics, we truly are talking about us and broadening that into our care for the environment, our care for the rest of life. But, but we haven't utilized even some of the imagery that is very much a part of our tradition. Um, and I don't think until you know, we get images and symbols in the kind of world that we live in with consumer identities and all of the rest, unless we get something that we can identify with in terms of, of common language or common symbols. Um, we're just trying to have upstart groups doing good, maybe all together, something will happen, but it's not really going to be a, a movement that can articulate why it's doing what it's doing. Uh, that was, that's probably any more profound than anything I've said tonight. Um, that was a really good statement, and I don't have a lot to add. I mean, I, I know people who are working on those issues. Uh, there's a really wonderful uh, network of people organized in this uh, forum on religion and ecology. A lot of that grows out of the work of uh, Thomas Berry, who's buried right here in, in, in Vermont. Uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and there's been a, a lot of focus on, you know, how to change values and, and with that, how to change articulation and vocabulary and, uh, images. Uh, it, that's, it's an undernourished, uh, area though, and it needs a, a lot more attention. And, uh, and, and I think you, you just put it very, very well. Thank you. Well, we have one more hand in the back of somebody I think I know, so I'm not going to miss her. Um, yes, could you tell us uh, if you had uh, one thing, one, maybe the most important thing that just a regular citizen could do right now at this time to help, um, you know, what would that be? What would your advice be? Well, right now, I think John put his finger on it, and as a native New Hampshire person, you are ready to do this, and that is to fan out. If, we, if we're happy with who's going to be elected in Vermont, let's fan out and go to support people in other places, uh, because I think this upcoming election is absolutely critical. And, and, and then part of that is, is supporting those groups which are fighting for protecting the, the electoral system and electoral reform. Uh, you know, there are a lot of good programs now for, uh, uh, for example, uh, Flip the Vote, uh, which is a, a, a group that targets uh, flipping uh, some, some red uh, points uh, on the map to, to blue. 
and, uh, vote and forward. vote forward. Uh, what's the one, Cameron, that we, Cameron wrote a million postcards to the, the state of Georgia. <laughs> what is that? Vote forward. Vote, vote forward. Anyhow, there's a, there's a lot that we can, uh, you know, even if you don't want to focus, you know, think Vermont is, is, is good enough, um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of ways to, to get involved uh, that, that don't involve big, big contributions. It seems to be effective in terms of, uh, uh, I mean, it is important to get, uh, we know a lot about which, the, which of, you know, w how to make these postcards, uh, for example, effective, you know, get them there early, you know, and uh, get them there frequently. And, uh, and there are a lot of get out the boat operations. And uh, I just think that right now we're at such a critical point uh, that that's the most, uh, you know, politically. Uh, and, um, you know, and, 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 and we just, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, uh, I mean, I shudder the thought to, to think what would happen if, we, if the Democrats lose the House. Um, but, um, Anyhow, uh, we, we have to try to be sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, of course, uh, I, I think, um, you know, hopefully we are going to see uh, uh, women and people who agree with women turn out and vote uh, on these issues in a way that we haven't ever seen before. We'll just have to hope for that and work for it and see what happens. Um, and uh, so, but that would be it. That's, the, you asked for one. <laughs>